20th century music discussion in itself, the issue of image. It's an honor for us to watch you in this laboratory and see what your brain brings forward and what your fingers do out of it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Sometimes it's Frankenstein, but I, I appreciate it too. We it's, love it's him, we love him. <laughs> Everybody says, ah, I love Baroque music because it is nice. Everybody says, I love classical music. <laughs> I don't music. think I've been one of the people who said that. <laughs> yeah. I, but uh, that's, that's the image. I love classical music because it's nice. I love romantic music because it's nice. And then they come and say, mm -hmm. yeah, but modern music, that is difficult because it's ugly. Is that true? I'm often on the road asked by people, why don't we have a Beethoven today? Or why don't we have a Mozart today? And what they mean is, I think, you know, why, why isn't there great music of heroic drama and fanfare like there was back then? What happened to that music today? Well, a lot of things happened to it. Um, two world wars, the advent of serialism, the rise of postmodernity, the sexual revolution, all of those things have changed society and because music is society and it's society that generates the people who make its music, um, that music, m music will always be of its time in, in some way. No matter what the moment that we're talking about, whether it's Bernstein, Bach, or the Beatles, the, the, the key to understanding all music is to understand that it is an individual experience and that there is no right or wrong way to experience it. You were talking about uh, twelve-tone music, and you said it's not just—it's not just mathematics. It's as well the try to find emotions into a strict, in, in, in inside a strict form. And you you referred to Alban Berg. A few moments that stand out for me, just as a musician and as a listener, that are beautiful poetic moments. I'm just—I'm searching for musical poetry and and and, and deep meaning. And I would play for you just a, a little bit of the first uh, sonata of Alban Berg, one of the composers who was to, you know, to, to practice and experiment with 12-tone um, uh, applications in that methodology in a very different way than his contemporaries did. Something about it, for me, is so poetic and so tangible, and you don't have to know anything about Alvenberg or Vienna or Twelve Tone or Schoenberg or the whole lot of it to sense that poetry. A little bit of this music has something of the quality of something's coming, you know, and this deep sense of unease. I don't find in the music of Mahler or Strauss, though I love those composers too. It's just a special thing that happened in music and it we would be very much amiss not to, not to touch on it. And there was Platon who once said, if you change the rules of harmony, you change the rule of a political system. Mm. Is that perhaps a fear really of politicians that Music which distracts order is a sign of no order in society? Well, the, yes it is, and I think, I think the corollary is even more true and probably more relevant to our time, um, that, you know, in a sense what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If there's a kind <laughs> of music that, um, that can be said to be anarchic, as I think there can, um, then it should follow that there are also kinds of music which would cause people to fall in line. Where it starts actually was in the 20s, especially in Germany again, when music was really politicized by, by, by composers and poets as well. And one mm. couple of that was uh, Brecht and Weil, who really considered themselves as a political force. And there was the Three Penny Opera uh, by, exactly. by Bertolt Brecht, uh, and of course by Kurt Weil, which was a political statement, and of course taught somebody like Hitler uh, that they have a power because they were as well popular musicians. Yes. They did art 
and they well, politically influenced and led the masses. And there is a song you, 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 you have uh, looked at, it's the Kanon song. Uh, what, 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 perhaps you can show us on the piano what, to, yeah. what, what it is about. Something about it um, seems to me almost klezmer in, in the harmonies. It's where you get this. The soldaten wohnen, this repetition of this figure, yeah. the marching, the, the inevitable marching of the soldiers, this beat that's not quitting. The harmonies are highly unpredictable and hard to manage. They're not typical pop song four on the floor sort of piano writing. Actually, if we're going to take it apart on the piano, it's not quite so cabaret. Um. And yet, it's dance music. So there's this inherent contradiction. On one hand, we're talking about sending people off to the meat grinder, turning them into beef tartare, and yet it's you know, it's this, it's this kind of, it's a cabaret thing. You said, I mean, we are talking about the war and whatever. We will come to that, how it changed music. But how did the sexual revolution change music? What that happened there? Well, um, in, in a lot of ways. Um, obviously, one would be um, composers and particularly lyricists' ability to address sex and gender in their work. I'm amazed how often the idea of attraction um, and, and desire is symbolized by marriage, okay. which itself, I think we can all agree, is not in and of itself a particularly ero erotic idea. <laughs> there's, a, there's a Gershwin song called Soon, which is all about this thing that's coming soon. Soon we will be able to enjoy each other. That's what that song is about. And you can hear it in the music too, and what happens, not just in the lyrics. think that it's actually marriage that they're talking about. They're talking about sex, but it was the 1920s, and you, you couldn't write it like Nicki Minaj and Drake can write it now. The day you're mine, this world will be in tune. Please let that day come soon. That's what these closing lyrics are. The singer doesn't have something yet that he wants. It's only going to happen if he's married. Come on, folks. I mean, this is, this is, <laughs> we're talking about post-marital sex. The most erotic thing, I guess, that the, 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 they could write about at the time. I mean, this is, this is, this is you know, pre-code days in Hollywood. So, so the way that sex, and particularly women, were treated in popular song is something you really have to look at if you want to understand, um, well, at, at least the treatment of women in American popular music right up to the present day. And we came up with a postmodern times, which was going together with the idea that we don't have any ideas anymore. Uh, that everything is, has been said, every note and combination of notes has been done. We arrived in the history of music at noise again, as mm. we have seen. Mm. Could you give an example of a homemade Cameron Carpenter postmodern idea piece? So, what would you choose? What would you choose, and how would you? Um, put it together. There are any number of pieces that kind of go like this. The color. 
of the letter A. Is a color without a number. It's easy to make fun of, um, but those pieces are important because it's never possible to say uh, any kind of human expression is illegitimate. It was always legitimate to the person who was expressing it, and we have to take that seriously. This is a trick of the 20th century as well. Yes. That people started doing things. Like, they didn't have iPads. Funny how it does work with an iPad. Yeah, actually the idea was um, that you could get originally alternative sounds out of, leave that one there, because we can, probably oh. works better if it's this way. Slide it down this way, not on the screen, but oh. yes, just exactly not. Well, like it's that. just a time way, you know. Right. Don't worry about <laughs> it. And then up here is still a normal piano, and down here I have something like what John Cage would have done, a little bit. anything to say to minimal music? Minimalism is a kind of, of course you'd have to say a misleading term because uh, it doesn't sound minimal at all. It sounds oftentimes um, repetitious or better hypnotic. So here's a six note figure and you could turn it upside down and you could put those ideas together. This could repeat in a number of cycles, a number of ways, and one could, one could have... Now this could go on for 20 or 30 seconds. We'll skip ahead, though, to a harmonic change. Remember, the stuff that's in my right hand, though, is remaining. So in a sense, it's minimal, in the sense that it's the amount of material at hand is minimal. We're not, we're not, we don't have a melody, we have harmonies of a fashion, we have rhythm, we have rhythm in the figure, and we have rhythm, rhythm of the harmonic change. There would be like maybe 16 repetitions before you'd get, I'm doing eight now I think, before you get a change, and then you might have another change. Thank Thanks. you for everything. The pleasure's mine.